Good morning, and let me share with you something interesting. Song of Solomon 2.4 He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Now, I know, you know, you probably remember as a child in Sunday school singing that song, he brought me to his banqueting table, and you sit there and make little hand motions like you're eating something, and then you say his banner over me is love, and you put your hands over your head, uh, you know, picture a banner. Um... But, you know, grammatically, it wasn't quite correct. For one thing, it's not the banqueting table. It's a banqueting house. And for the other thing, the King James Version said his banner over me was love. Now, that kind of is misleading because it sounds like, well, you know, the king loved Sol or Solomon, loved the Shulamite woman, but then once they got to the banqueting table, that kind of came to an end, and he just kind of left her hanging didn't love her anymore and that doesn't bode too well as far as our understanding of uh, the relationship you know our relationship with God God just doesn't take us to the banqueting table and then abandon us and doesn't love us anymore he still loves us and we probably would more rightly say his banner over me is love what does it say in the Hebrew well Hebrew doesn't have your state of being verbs state of being was is our um, you don't have those words there. They're, you know, you can actually have a sentence in Hebrew without a verb. Uh, where in English, you have to have a verb. And usually sometimes, you know, the man is a hero. Uh, we put in the word is, which is called a state of being verb. Well, in Hebrew, it just being the man, a hero. And it's up to you to put in was or is. Once upon a time he was a hero, but no longer is. Um, or he is and will continue to be a hero. So why does the King James Version stick the word was in there? Well, grammatically, they're probably right to do that because uh, the word brought is in a perfect form, which is not, there are no tenses in Hebrew either. Uh, you only have what's called inflictions. You have a, a perfect infliction, which is a completed action, and an imperfect infliction, which is an incompleted action. There's no present tense. You do have a participle, which, you know, it generally is a present tense. I am going, you know, into an ing shows you ha are doing it and continuing to do it. So kind of shows a continuance as well as a present. Um, but you would carry that over uh, it was always, you know, they've got the conjunction in there for his banner over me is love so you would carry that over into uh, that next phrase and that's why they would say was because it was a perfect tense at the beginning he brought me um, you know completed action and therefore, the word, uh, his banner over me, was love, completed action. Well, and that's, uh, you know, that's splitting hairs. Because, you know, we can understand that maybe she's referring to that particular moment in time. That there's a banner over her for love. You know, big banner that says love or something at that banquet. And once the banquet is over, they took the banner down. Um, and was fits. Uh, only the word banner in Hebrew does, it's the word gadol, uh, and that word uh, means a flag, or banner, or standard. In ancient times, uh, the idea of a flag really had its origins in Oriental culture, with the Chinese, it came over through India and into the Middle East. Uh, Syria was the first to pick up on it. This is during the time of King Solomon. And they developed a flag for identification purposes. When going to battle, it was where the soldiers could rally around, knowing, you know, this was, you know, our friends, not the foe. Um, and it was also used when they conquered a city. See, in those days, the battle was over when you conquered a city. Uh, they fought for cities. And once they conquered a city, they put their flag up there saying, we got it, it's ours. So it was a picture of conquest as well. 
Now, the Midrash suggests that possibly the Shulamite woman, this woman that King Solomon's in love with, could have very well been a Moabite slave. And um, I, I talked about this before. I talk about it in our um, Tuesday evening midweek Bible study class on the Song of Solomon. And so I won't go into the detail. Uh, we don't know for sure. It's just speculation that she was a slave. It does say that she was caring for vineyards that weren't her own, um, which you know indicated that maybe she was a slave or a servant of some type. And uh, you know, in the year of jubilee, she would have been released, or she could have still been owned by somebody. And King Solomon comes along, falls in love with her. She's uh, a proselyte, you know, is converted to Judaism, which gives her the right to marry uh, Hebrew, except, you know, it's still a forbidden romance because of the fact of, uh, you know, she's just a commoner and, you know, he's royalty. Royalty didn't marry beneath them, but that didn't matter because King Solomon and the Shulamite woman, they were in love. And so, uh, so the idea is that when it's saying his banner over me is love could have been to show ownership a conquest maybe uh, that you know she con he conquered her heart or that you know he bought her away from the slave owner now he owns her only the reason for the ownership isn't to get labor out of her the reason for the ownership is love and note the word love it's in a feminine form he loves me in a feminine form now I know you know feminists will throw salt in the air over what I'm going to say but I'm talking history okay historically the love of a woman was considered different than the love of a man in a marriage relationship a man loves a woman differently than a woman loves a man uh, as they always say the man is attracted by the woman's beauty where the woman's attracted by the man's ability to protect her and care for her and, um, put a cover over her uh, and she wants to feel you know secure in that relationship uh, it's an emotional love where for a man it's more of a practical love uh, you know, there, 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 it, the love between a man and woman was viewed differently in those days. Uh, and yet, in a romantic sense, uh, it was pretty much the same. And what she's saying is that, you know, forget the difference in gender. His love for me is like a woman's love. It's an emotional love. He loves my soul. He just doesn't love my beauty. You know, I talked about the Word of God um, on our Monday night Hebrew Aramaic workshop, and I described how the sages would teach that the Word of God is like a garment that's worn by a beautiful woman, and it gives a parable of a prince who falls in love with a princess who wears a very beautiful garment, but when he marries this princess, it's not the garment he's in love with. It's the princess he's in love with. It's her soul that he's in love with. And so too with the Word of God. Oh, it's a beautiful garment. A lot of wonderful words in there and nice stories. But we need to move beyond the garment and look at the soul of the Word of God. For only when we begin searching for the soul of the Word of God do we find the divine, do we find God. It says, if you seek me, search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you. You know, I'm not a prophet. I'm not, um, I'm not even a preacher. I, I'm more in the role of a scribe. If uh, I have any spiritual gift, it's probably that of a scribe. Uh, and my, my job as a scribe is to encourage others to study the Word of God. Study it in its original languages. Search the Word of God. Search it out. Not just, don't just read the Word of God. Meditate on it. So, you know, some people have a problem just reading through the Bible in one year. Some can't even do that. And you've got a few people who actually study the Bible. They'll pull out commentaries and dictionaries and 
You know, they'll do a good study of the Word of God, but how many really meditate on the Word of God? That's the third level, to meditate on the Word of God. Because upon meditation is where you discover the soul of the Word of God. And in discovering the soul of the Word of God, you discover God Himself. You discover His presence in the Word of God. And so he brought me to his banqueting table. That's an interesting word, banqueting, because it's the word hayayen, from the root word yayen, which simply means wine. And uh, recent archaeological discoveries have cast new light on the way we would translate this, because they've recently discovered one of the oldest uh, back in 2013, archaeologists up in northern Galilee discovered one of the oldest um, uh, wine cellars uh, that's been discovered. It dates all the way back to the time of King Solomon. And it was located right next to a dining hall, a banquet hall, if you wish. But he didn't take her to the banqueting hall. He took her to the wine house. It's Bar Hayayan. And... The wine house, well, the word bayeth could easily be a cellar as well. It's just a dwelling place. Um, so he took her to the wine cellar. Now, why would he take her to the wine cellar? Well, for one thing, as a king, he had the best wine uh, available. And not only that, Israel was noted in those days for its wine. Well, you know, their elites would travel from all the known world to Israel to get their wine. And of course the king, King Solomon, probably had the best wine cellar in the world and the best wine hidden away in the cellar. And as king, nobody could get into that wine cellar without his permission. If anybody enters that wine cellar without the permission, the permission of the king, they get their heads lopped off. It was the one place a king could go where he had absolute solitude. Where he could take his beloved to a place where he knows he would not be disturbed. Nobody would dare enter that wine cellar without his permission. And so he was very secure. It was a very secure place. And he could take her to that little wine cellar and there they could share a nice romantic candlelight dinner and she could pick out any wine she wanted. Um, plus, the Talmud teaches in Sanhedrin 103b that when two companions share a meal and share wine, they are drawn closer, and in that closeness they can accomplish things that not even the Archangel Michael could accomplish. And so this is really a picture of drawing as close as possible. He is taking her. And note this word, he brought, is in a hip field form, which means it's causative. He came and brought her. He didn't send out an invitation, meet me at the wine cellar. He went and met her and brought her to the wine cellar and they went into the wine cellar together and word given to nobody allowed to enter that wine cellar and there they, they could have their time alone together. A nice romantic time um, in drawing very close together. Drawing close together intimately. And so too with God. The picture that, you know, the Shulamite woman, if she was really a slave, was living a very hard life, taking care of two vineyards. It was night to day, very little sleep, very little time to herself, and a very stressful life, trying to keep up with her quotas. And along comes a king who takes her away into a very secluded spot, one of the most protective spots he could take her. And there would be that picture of drawing very close together. You know, in this day and age, uh, you know, Christians, I think, are entering a time now of a very difficult time, uh, especially in this country. And we're seeking protection. We're seeking a covering. And God, all we have to do is just make ourselves available. To love God with all our heart, soul, and might. And he will come and get us. The hip field form. He'll come and get us. 
and he'll take us to this place of seclusion, of total protection, one of the safest spots in the world to be is in the middle of his will. And all we have to do is just submit to his will and he will take us and in his will we will experience joy and peace and safety. He's always with us 24-7. And when everything we do, we do is unto him. He'll draw us into his by youth high again, that wine cellar, that place of total security.